Hello, I'm Will. Welcome to Research Pod. Once upon a time, not too very long ago, diabetes was a terminal condition, those with type 1 diabetes often not surviving more than a few months after birth. Today, over 1 in 10 people are living with it, a number that's continuing to rise. This is a testament to the success of insulin as a treatment, and also the concerning state of global nutrition. But, with such a huge prevalence of the condition and the successes in its management, you'd think we know just about all there is to know about diabetes. Right? Today I'm speaking with Dr. Alexander Hamilton about his research into alpha cells, amino acids, and why we might need to rewrite the textbook on diabetes. And joining me from Lund University's Faculty of Medicine is Dr. Alexander Hamilton. Hello there. Hello. For myself, and for everybody listening at home, could you tell us a bit about yourself, your work, and uh, what's led to where you are now? Metabolism was always something I was really interested in, and then it just kind of grew from there. Like, I initially became a, a lab technician straight out of university, and that was at a diabetes center. And then as of kind of why I specifically have gone towards the alpha cells and the islet, I suppose, is because I think it's an area which we don't understand a lot about. There's a lot of research on the beta cells, which are the cells that secrete insulin. And of course, everyone knows insulin is very important in diabetes. I am a researcher at the moment. I'm a postdoc, uh, kind of employed by Lund University, but my grant is an international grant. So I do a lot of my work across uh, the Orison Strait uh, in Copenhagen. So I kind of work between the University of Copenhagen and Lund University. My Swedish group is run by Lena Leyerson predominantly kind of works on beta cells, but she also does a bit of work on alpha cells. She looks at kind of micro RNAs, also looks at how these cells function, how they secrete the hormones. So to say how a beta cell secretes insulin or how an alpha cell secretes glucagon. My PI in Denmark is called Jakob Knudsen, someone who actually did their postdoc where I did my PhD when I was at the University of Oxford. His work basically centers on the alpha cells, so his focus is completely on the alpha cell. And he's trying to work out how glucon secretion is regulated, but looking at it away from just looking at it and how it's controlled by glucose, but looking at more how it's controlled by fatty acids and also what I look at, which is amino acids. There's a lot of fundamental knowledge we don't actually understand. So I think my approach to science is to work on things which have an impact, whether that be you know producing new therapeutics or actually answering fundamental questions that will actually lead to differences in the textbook, not just the paper. So I think that's why I'm kind of in this field. What would you say the state of the world is in regards to diabetic health currently in 2024? Well, I think it's probably one of the largest kind of health problems we have. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, but you also have diabetes. There's around over 500 million people living with it right now. And that's forecast to increase to around 783 million by 2045. So this is a lot. This is almost one in 10 population. And that might also be people with a condition called pre-diabetes that occurs all this and some people are undiagnosed and it's a serious problem and I think a lot of people view diabetes as oh it's just high blood sugar but that high blood sugar also causes secondary complications it increases your risk of cardiovascular complications like stroke heart attack atherosclerosis these kind of things it causes amputation because you get neuropathy so you get loose sensation in your peripheral feet and things so it's one of the leading causes of amputation it might be the leading cause actually causes retinopathy which is where you get microvascular complications in your eyes so it can get particles of blindness so it's a real problem and although we have insulin to treat it and also other drugs like metformin uh, glp1 receptor agonists and various other things it's still a problem we still have people developing these complications and there's still more that can be done something that i think has been widely regarded as a, a kind of a fixed thing that we've invented insulin and we have solved the monolithic form that is the one type of diabetes that there is so is that uh, a challenge in terms of addressing public health awareness as well as public health concerns yeah and i think just for the listeners people with type 1 diabetes which is where you have autoimmune destruction of your beta cells and this is often people have this from a young age they would just go straight onto insulin, whereas type 2 diabetics, which is usually where people have insulin resistance and then their beta cells fail, they would initially go onto drugs like metformin or drugs like sulfonylureas and various other things. And then eventually they might go into insulin. And insulin's very good, but the problem with it is when you take it and you inject it, you can be at risk of hypoglycemia. So that's where your blood glucose drops to very low levels. And that is very dangerous. That causes like coma um, and even in the worst case scenarios, death. And with 
the current insulin treatment, it's very difficult for a diabetic to keep their glucose levels as good well as someone who's non-diabetic and the fluctuation in glucose levels forces those kind of secondary complications later in life and also just the daily injections as well that can be difficult there has been advancements where you've got insulin pumps and things like that which make it easier but these aren't widely available to people with diabetes so there are still problems and people with diabetes still have a lower life expectancy than someone without glucagon could be the answer to some of those problems which we'll get into later well, if you could start off by explaining what's happening on an institutional level at the Lund Diabetes Centre, then we'll get to the personal level and this uh, paper-specific work we're talking about today. The centre is, I'd say it's very islet-focused compared to other diabetes centres around the world. There's a big focus on beta cells, a lot of work on beta cell lines, and groups basically looking at various different aspects of that. So you have groups looking at the epigenetics that so looking at how epigenetic changes in people with diabetes and without effect contribute to diabetes pathogenesis but you also have groups looking more at the function so how does the beta cell or alpha cells as well how do they actually secrete how does exocytosis occur and the, like the actual function basis of that there's also work looking at stem cells so basically they get stem cells and then try and convert them into beta cells and then they can use this as a model to look at how when they say knock out a gene that comes up as being involved in diabetes, how, when they knock that out, how that can affect insulin secretion. So there's a lot of work on that. There's also the TEDDY study, which is one of the major type 1 diabetic studies in the world. So that's more of a clinical work where they get patients and they kind of analyse various aspects of people, type, generally children with type 1 diabetes. You mentioned earlier glucagon in diabetes, and we've talked about type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but to establish the, the model as things stand, what is glucagon? What does it do in a normal regulated digestive system? And how does that change in a diabetic condition? So glucagon is kind of the main hormone responsible for increasing your blood glucose levels. So the way glucose is controlled in your body is when you eat a meal, say, and you have carbohydrates, that will increase your blood glucose levels. And then insulin will bring those down. But to prevent yourself becoming hypoglycemic, which is kind of low blood glucose, which is quite dangerous, you also have glucon there, which can increase glucose levels. And it does this predominantly by being secreted from the pancreas, as insulin is as well, and then acting on the liver and basically telling the liver to produce glucose. So the liver can produce glucose either via breaking down glycogen, which is like a storage form of glucose, and breaking that down into individual glucose molecules, individual sugar molecules, or by actually synthesizing glucose from other substrates. These can be amino acids, lactate, glycerol. So glucon's main role is basically to prevent hypoglycemia and to basically keep your glucose levels at a normal level. And it does that in counteraction with insulin. So it's the two of them that control that. In diabetes, that goes wrong. So insulin, first of all, as most people know, stops working in diabetes. So in type 1, you don't get your beta cells are destroyed by your immune system. This is the type of diabetes you get often when you're younger. And that means that basically when you eat a meal and you get high glucose levels, you can't bring those down again. So they have to inject insulin. You then have type 2 diabetics who have, it's often caused by lifestyle, whether that be age or obesity, as well as genetic predisposition as well. And that's caused by kind of insulin resistance, peripheral insulin resistance. So you're basically tissues like your muscle and your fat become resistant to insulin. And this means they can't, because insulin basically tells them to take up glucose, they can't do that anymore. So your blood glucose levels increases, and this puts stress on the cells that produce insulin because they're basically not working, and that can also cause their dysfunction, and that's kind of what type 2 is. And that's generally how it's looked at. So you just look at an insulin, but at the same time, you've also got dysregulation of glucagon. So glucagon is usually, in a normal state, when you're at low glucose, glucagon will be high, and when you're at high glucose, glucagon will be low. But you kind of get an inversion of that. So you say when you, a diabetic eats a meal, rather than their glucagon being suppressed, it can actually be upregulated. And that means you get basically increasing blood glucose levels. And that together with the, the low levels of insulin means you're kind of in a state where you're promoting high blood glucose levels. It's kind of low insulin and the high glucagon kind of causing a perfect storm where you've got very high glucose levels in your blood. And then also there's another problem with people who take insulin. So this can be, this will be people with type 1 diabetes. It can cause you to go hypoglycemic when you inject it because you can kind of overdose basically. And then what happens in diabetics is they usually say in non-diabetics, 
when our blood glucose levels come down, you have glucagon, which counteracts that. And that keeps you at like a normal glucose level. But in people who inject insulin, it can go down because they're kind of overdosing. And then there's no real glucagon response. They lose the glucagon response. The mechanism why that happens is not completely understood. There's not really consensus. But they lose this response. And that can put them at real risk of becoming hypoglycemic. And hypoglycemia, which is low glucose levels, is very risky. And you mentioned at the start of your answer that the metabolites involved in digestion include amino acids amongst others, including lactates. For glucagon over-secretion, what does that over-secretion do in terms of amino acids in digestion circulation? Where do they go? Up, down? It's a bit confusing. So say if you had a glucagonoma, where you have basically a tumor in your alpha cells, which means you hypersecrete glucagon. Because glucagon, basically, it doesn't just control glucose levels. A lot of this new research is about it controlling amino acid levels as well. And it basically tells the liver to take up amino acids. And these amino acids either are degraded via ureogenesis, and urea is excreted by urine, that's why urine is called urine, um, or it can also be used to convert into glucose. And glucon basically is one of the major controllers of this process, so it controls your plasma amino acids. So if you've got too much glucagon, you'll lower your amino acids. And if you have too little, you'll increase them. Now, in the setting of diabetes, a lot of the new research suggests what happens is a lot of people with diabetes, they'll have fat in their liver. It's known as ectopic fat. So they'll have what's also known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this means they've basically got fat in their liver and that causes a variety of problems. It can cause insulin resistance. So their liver becomes resistant to insulin. And this is insulin resistance, as you know, one of the main facets of type 2 diabetes. But a lot of this research also suggests that fat can cause glucagon resistance. So that means that they kind of secrete glucagon. But then because the liver has become resistant to glucagon, you actually get an increase in amino acids because the liver has become unresponsive to glucagon. So that means it's not reacting to glucagon. And that means the amino acids levels increase in type 2 diabetes. And that means these amino acids then act to stimulate glucagon secretion because amino acids, they increase glucagon secretion, basically. And that means you get this hyper secretion of glucagon, which basically results in the liver producing more glucose because you have glucagon resistance in terms of the amino acid pathway, but this doesn't seem to affect the action of glucagon on glucose. So you get this, this kind of one of the main drivers. So that's basically what a lot of the research by fellow researchers at the University of Copenhagen have suggested. I would say like this is by no means a settled issue like it's a theory this liver alpha cell is known as the liver alpha cell axis but it's kind of a that they're proposing this is how glucagon becomes dysregulated in diabetes that you get this glucagon resistance and increase in amino acids and then that causes the hyper secretion of glucagon but in a standard setting what i'd say is glucagon would lower amino acids and then if you've got less glucagon you should get higher amino acids but in type 2 diabetes it's a bit different that loop of glucagon secretion, amino acids, glucagon amino acids back. Is that operating on the scale of hours, days? That's a good question. I'm not completely sure, but I'd say it's more like an acute thing. So say, so plasma, like your amino acids, the change in their concentrations would generally be dietary. So say if you eat a protein rich meal, that would increase your amino acid levels. They're also somewhat affected by whether you're fasted or in a fasted state, but I'd say that it's more to do with the dietary uptake and then i'd say it's acute so it's probably very quick so you, you eat amino acids and then that will trigger glucon secretion glucon then acts on the liver and will cause signaling in the liver which results in the uptake of amino acids and then their breakdown basically to address the action of glucagon as a hormone what does that binding site look like if we can get into maybe even the atomics of it, what happens at the moment of contact in that binding? So glucon is a hormone. That basically means it's a chemical messenger. It gets taken into the bloodstream and then has effects on that peripheral sites. Now the liver cells, the hepatocytes, will have glucon receptors and glucon will bind to these receptors. And the glucon receptor is a type of receptor known as a G-protein coupled receptor. There's lots of different G-protein coupled receptors. So glucon receptor is one. All the adrenal receptors are all G-protein protein coupled receptors so these are the receptors adrenaline works on and various other hormones will work on different g protein coupled receptors and in basic terms these g protein coupled receptors are basically it's a receptor like is coupled to another protein known as g protein and i won't go into too much detail about how it works but it basically activates that g protein then that g protein will act 
and cause an increase in something known as a secondary messenger. So in the case of glucagon, this causes an increase in a signaling molecule known as cyclic AMP by basically activating an enzyme known as adenylate cyclase. And that enzyme converts ATP, which is a kind of the energy currency of cell, it's a molecule, into cyclic AMP. So the important thing here is basically that the glucagon binds, then you get this triggering and you get this big increase in cyclic AMP in the cell. That cyclic AMP can then act on a kinase. Uh, kinases are basically proteins which phosphorylate other proteins. Phosphorylation is kind of a, it's like an on and off switch for various different things. And the big increase in cyclic AMP causes activation of PKA, which is protein kinase A. And then PKA has a variety of targets. So it can affect, you know, calcium channels in the membrane. It can affect different enzymes affect various things it's got quite a wide repertoire of things that it can affect and it depends on the cell type it's in in hepatocytes when you get activation of protein kinase a that will phosphorylate an enzyme uh, you mentioned lock and key in results to enzymes so that will phosphorylate glycogen synthase and that will activate glycogen synthase and what glycogen synthase does in simple terms is it basically it's one of the main enzymes responsible for the conversion of glucose into glycogen so glucose is like a single sugar molecule and that what glycogen synthase does is it basically makes into a big chain, a big glycogen chain, and that's how it's stored. Sorry, gluc- the phosphorylation will actually inactivate glycogen synthase. I've got that the wrong way around. So it will inhibit that enzyme, and that means you'll reverse the reaction. So you'll get a conversion of glycogen back into glucose. When it comes to intake of energy and expenditure and metabolism, imagine having breakfast, that is food going in, and then... Before you have lunch, there will be this line on the graph goes up, this line goes down, and take me through it in a a fundamental level. Yeah, so basically when you have a meal, like your glucose levels will increase and that will stimulate insulin, which then tries to reduce them. At the same time, that will inhibit glucagon. So generally when you're in that postprandial state, so after a meal, insulin is stimulated and glucagon is inhibited. And then after that's passed, once you're in the fasted state, because your insulin has acted, the glucose levels begin to fall because they're taken up by the liver to produce glycogen or also taken up by fat tissue to produce fat. Then as the glucose levels drop, that's when glucagon then begins to act. And basically it signals to the liver and tells it to produce glucose, basically. It keeps that kind of glucose homeostasis, so keeps glucose at a level. To pick the metabolization of amino acids versus glycerol, lactate and other metabolites apart, What sets amino acids apart from any of those or them from each other? I think with those three you've chosen are kind of the substrates for gluconeogenesis. So they're the things that can basically generate, you can basically use to convert into glucose in the liver. I'd say more where they're from, I guess, like glycerol is generally from, so glycerol, when we talk about fats, like the fats you eat, they're in the form of triacyl glycerols or TAGs. And they, what a tag is, getting very into chemistry now, but it's basically a glycerol molecule, which is like the backbone. And then you've got three fatty acids attached. That's what it's triacyl, means three fatty acids, glycerol. And then when this gets in the body, you've got a process known as lipolysis, which is where the in your adipose tissue, the fat is basically stored as triacylglycerides. So these, these tags, basically. And then when it gets broken down, it gets broken down into fatty acids, which can be used by different cells to produce energy. And then this glycerol backbone that can then be used and converted into glucose. So it's kind of more the origin, whereas amino acids would more come from, they're from protein rather than fat. They can also, your muscle also has stores of amino acids, so it can release amino acids and things like that. And then lactate is, when you hear people talk about lactic acid, lactate is, they're more actually talking about lactate. So lactate is, it's basically a byproduct of when your body is trying to produce energy, but it can't, when it's trying to produce energy via anaerobic respiration, which is respiration without oxygen. So your body can either produce it via aerobic respiration, which is in the mitochondria where you use oxygen or anaerobically. And that's what lactate is. And this lactate can also be used and converted into glucose. And there's kind of a cycling between lactate and glucose, but I'd say amino acids, it's more like their origin is from proteins. They can also be, those other two are kind of more byproducts, let's say, of other reactions, whereas amino acids can actually also be used to produce energy. So they don't just produce glucose. Like the fatty acids and the glucose that's talked about, amino acids can also be taken up into the mitochondria and used to produce energy or ATP, which is kind of the energy currency. 
So that's kind of how they differ. And also amino acids, there's like 20 of them. So it's not like when you're talking about glycerol and lactate, you're talking about one molecule. Amino acids, there's 20 and they will have differential effects. Amongst that broad group, which particular amino acids, if any, have the most to bear on your research? For my research, if we look at like the literature, alanine is one that always comes up. Cysteine also comes up. They, these have big effects on glucuron secretion. Glycine and glutamate have also been shown to stimulate glucuron secretion. So yeah, and it's just working out the mechanisms by which, how they do this. So we know these stimulate glucose secretion, but we don't necessarily know how. Arginine as well, this is often researched. Then you've also got some people who talk about tyrosine and stuff, but the mechanisms by those, which those work are quite poorly understood. And even the ones we know, like there's some ideas of how they work, but they're not substantiated and there's definitely not consensus. And that's kind of the main thing with the alpha cell field that no one, there's no consensus basically. Honing things down even further to the individual cell level here, the alpha cell involvement that you've been researching that's kind of defined the paper that we're working on. Um, yeah, can you tell me more about the amino acids and their involvement here, uh, the effects of uh, the timing and how what your research is doing is putting forward something of a, a different view to the accepted textbook model? Yeah, I think generally before, like when, to say with the beta cell, which is the cell that produces insulin, we kind of know how it works and it's regulated by glucose. Glucose increases and you get an increase in insulin secretion. And researchers looking at that, I'm including a PhD supervisor actually, they then shifted to look at alpha cells, but they tended to define it looking at it in terms of glucose as well. And a lot of the current models we have rely on the alpha cell sensing glucose and then that leading to glucose secretion. So the idea is that low glucose, when the glucose is low, the alpha cell senses this and you get glucose secretion. There's some problems with that in that means the cell is most active when the fuel source is low. So the when energy is low, the alpha cell is most active. If it's using glucose as its primary fuel, it kind of doesn't add up because it's most active when the fuel it uses is at its lowest. So there's kind of been a rethinking around that and it's generally been pushed by my PI I work for in Denmark, so Jakob Knudsen, who's looked more at, okay, what's hydrogen in the fasted state, what fuel is available? And he's actually done a lot of work on fatty acids because these actually increase when you're fasted. So you get an increase in fatty acids and he's shown that these are important in terms of glucose secretion. And then at the same time, there's been this emergence of the role of amino acids. And that's caused by the fact that when we look at glucagon and we disrupt its action, we see amino acids go up, basically. So it's, And we also know amino acids stimulate glucose secretion. But in terms of the paper I wrote, I think what I'm more trying to say is that, okay, fatty acids are important, but are amino acids actually important when you're fasted? And I think generally, I'd say that they may not be because they don't increase in the same way by acids. You generally see amino acids actually drop when you're fasted because they start to be utilized by the liver to produce glucose. The actual plasma levels don't increase. There's some that increase, so the branch chain amino acids, but these are actually not, they're the few amino acids that don't stimulate glucose secretion. So yeah, that's, I think it's more likely that the effect of amino acids on glucagon is via kind of perhaps dietary. So when you eat, say, a high protein meal, that will stimulate glucose secretion. And it may actually be separate. The control, the fact glucagon is active in the fastest state or when glucose levels are low is more a result of the metabolism of fatty acids and the interrelationship between fatty acids and glucose. What the paper does is it kind of talks about what glucagon does. And then it's about this has led to basically people looking at it just in terms of glucose. And then what the paper is really about is that the it's about the shift in the research that I'm doing. Like the research used to just be, oh, glucon regulates glucose, but now it's more shifting towards, okay, but it has the, it also controls am amino acids. It controls how amino acids are, it controls amino acid homeostasis as well. And there's like emerging research and how it's regulated and things like that. So I think going along those lines might be a better way. What does this new view on alpha cell involvement and activity mean for, I don't know, the past 30 years of textbooks talking about diabetes? Are people going to have to go book and amend a lot of figures and diagrams to say, you know, asterisk C here? Yeah, I think this is generally just seen in the 
kind of like you just see it in the academic literature and it's but there's still like you go even me i go to a conference and it's still mostly on beta cells so i think hopefully with this shift where we're like looking at the cell in a new way um hopefully we can i think the textbooks need to be changed if you look at textbook now there's very little information on gluconeuropathy it'll be like a paragraph or so so i think there's it's a real we really need to understand what what this is about and there's really strong evidence suggesting why that glucon is really important for diabetes they say that the the fatty component of diet is going to be having more or at least more of a surprising effect yeah it depends on the context so i think after a meal when your amino plasma amino acids rise that's when we have an effect on glucon secretion although this is still up for debate i'm saying uh whereas fatty acids they generally increase in the fasted state but it's not necessarily dietary fatty acids because the dietary comes in the form of triosylglyceride, so that's not fatty acids per se. Hmm. I'm just trying to like visualize this on a clock of you know a fasting start to food intake to metabolism to out to try and say that if fasting is when the lipids are being digested and then food amino acids in and kind of to graph things out either on a clock or, you know, a line graph over time, where exactly is the the new perspective of what is happening at what time to which digestive state? Yeah, it's more that, so generally when we talk about the timing, we're talking about fasting and postprandial, which means after a meal. And basically what I'm saying is in the fasted state, it seems unlikely that amino acids would affect glucagon secretion. So the fastest state would be like, say, overnight when you're not eating. It's unlikely that amino acids would affect glucagon secretion because they're not, they don't increase generally, the ones that we think increase glucagon secretion. But after a meal where you eat protein, then that would increase your amino acids and that could be what stimulates when glucagon secretion is stimulated. But glucagon secretion would also be stimulated in the fastest state and that would be by fatty acids, which aren't dietary taken up, like the way they, fatty acids released from your adipose tissue. So from your fat tissue that enter the bloodstream, because when you're in a fasted state, your body begins to basically break down fat in your adipose mm-hmm. tissue and then release it into your bloodstream. And then it's used by the liver and it can be used as a fuel source, but it can also be basically the use of fuel source when you're, you're fasted. To think about what these findings that you're working on and the ongoing research could mean for people listening. Are we in a position to say what these changes could mean for people's diet? If there's anyone who wants to take immediate action, do we have the position to tell them to do that? I'd say like with the specific research I'm doing, it's kind of at its infancy. And you've got to remember we're looking at an isolated system. So we're saying how amino acids affect glucagon. But amino acids don't, that's not their only thing. That's not that they also, I mean, amino acids also can stimulate insulin secretion when glucose levels are high. So it's by no means simplistic that you would kind of because if say a diabetic was listening they might think okay if i don't eat amino acids then that would lower my glucose secretion and then therefore it may have positive effects or it may prevent diabetes but then you also have a stimulatory effect on insulin which would be positive for diabetes so it's by no means saying this there is in terms of diet i think generally what most doctors would say i'm not a medical doctor but like what they would say is balanced diet you know eating healthy food, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, a decent amount of protein, a decent amount of carbohydrate. And I'm not going to delve into that. There is a lot of like fad diets as well, like low carb and stuff, but I don't have the expertise to talk about those. I would say there is some like mouse research where you look at like reduce like an amino acid, like a single amino acid, say methionine, which is one of the amino acids. And they see that this has quite startling effects on whole body metabolism. I think there is an interesting thing about amino acids in terms of that isn't just related to my research, glucagon, but they could have wider effects. And when you reduce this methionine, then it has like large effects, quite positive effects, kind of increasing energy expenditure, which is good and kind of improving insulin sensitivity, which is kind of the opposite to insulin resistance. So improving how insulin functions, but that's in mice. And that's like a lot of research in mice. And like, I think you always have to take it with a pinch of salt. Also, if like you were to try a diet where you just remove one amino acid, you'd find it impossible as a human being because like we're not eating a mouse's diet. We're not, the, these are engineered diets and labs. We're, eat, we're going to the supermarket. If I'm eating like cheese or something with protein in it, it's not going to just have like one amino acid. It has a multiple. So realistically speaking, there's some interesting research on diet. I, I generally say like more needs to be done basically. And the nutrition field is 
renowned for being very like murky. So yeah, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> and we shouldn't be expecting the Alexander Hamilton diet advice book coming to shelves anytime soon. No, certainly not. <laughs> Well, to focus on the science, what plans are there to put this to the test in either animal models or from collecting human data? Are there plans for more investigation along this route? So yeah, there's there's lots of research on this at the moment. So there's it's a really emerging field where people are looking at the alpha cell in a different way and then looking at it in terms of looking at amino acids, fatty acids and things like that. So we're not the only group working on this. And I think, yeah, trying to do it, a lot of the work we do is in mice, but also trying to work with human islets and we get those in Lund. So I think that that's something we want to look at, basically. So yeah, there's a lot of progress that can be made, basically. For people who are listening to this, maybe want to know more about your research, where can they find it? Is there anyone else who you think would have something to benefit from listening to this conversation? I think the main thing from this conversation that I'd want to suggest, I don't think it's like an action point for clinicians to act on clinicians are also aware of the role of glucagon and its effect it's how it's dysregulated in diabetes and there is i'd say it's more for current researchers just pointing out we're kind of ignoring this area like most people research insulin there's so much research in this but there's the real need to actually understand the alpha cell and how glucagon is regulated and there are some advancements with this amino acid work which suggests there's more to it than meets the eye and if we focus on this we could potentially come up with like new therapies and things and as you say maybe like some dietary things as well although again the stress that's that's very much in its infancy but like yeah there's a massive opportunity here to kind of understand more and if people wanted to stay in touch where could they find more from you online there's another podcast i did i don't know if i can advertise other but but i did it with um it's was the danish diabetes academy or it's actually known as the danish diabetes and endocrine academy now a, a podcast called postdocs talking which is also available on spotify and I'm sure other things as well and with that i did that with a researcher a, a danish researcher known as uh, nikolai Weber albrechtsen um, and he is kind of one of the figureheads behind like this that liver alpha cell axis i was talking about how glucon regulates amino acids and how amino acids regulate glucagon he's more of a clinician so i was coming at it from the alpha cell and my expertise and that but he was talking more about the effects on the liver so if you wanted more in depth and like his knowledge as well i'd suggest checking out that podcast i'd also suggest a lot of this glucon research if you check out an author known as roger unger who's american he passed away recently but he spearheaded a lot of the research into glucon and its importance in diabetes and a lot of his research is probably not ignored but it's it's not got its prominence it deserves perhaps and i think that he kind of underlines that you need glucon to get diabetes and it's quite striking so i'd I'd suggest looking at that as well